The Where Our Minds Wanda podcast may contain sensitive content and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Greetings, fellow wanderers, to the places our minds wander. Where strange lights speed beyond reason across a clear night sky. The house at the end of the road where disembodied voices whisper and strange noises make the living shiver. Lurking shadows hiding on the edge of the woods just outside your back door. Odd true events throughout time that lead you down the rabbit hole. I'm Wes. And I'm Beth. And this is where our minds wander. Hello and welcome to Where Our Minds Wander, all you fellow wanderers. I'm Wes, and that's my wife and co-host, Beth. Hello, everyone. And I just want to say, uh, for those of you that are just finding us, thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoy our show. And for those of you that have been coming back each week for our episodes, thank you for continuing to support our show. We really appreciate you. And, you know, it has been such a long, hectic week. I'm so thrilled to be sitting here behind the mic, getting ready to record this new episode. I'm quite excited about it. Me too. So with that said, what are you going to entertain us with tonight, Beth? A possession. An entertaining possession? (laughs) In a way, yes. Well, do tell. I'm all ears. A crowd gathered around the stage in France in the 1590s to watch the 20-year-old girl. She already had a reputation as being a bit odd. She wasn't married, and she was known to travel around town in men's clothes. But they didn't flock to the stage to see her clothes. They came to see her in the throes of torment. Ooh. Outwardly, the girl looked completely fine. She walked out on stage of her own accord. But then... Her eyes rolled back in her head. Her blood-red tongue stuck out from her mouth, abnormally long as she hissed like a snake. As her father stood over her, the girl fell to the stage on her back, and contorting her body, she somehow lifted several feet in the air, crossing the stage in just a few arches of her body, as if something was dragging her like a rag doll. Her mouth remained closed, as a horrible, guttural voice seemed to roar from her belly, spitting insults and blasphemy. She would writhe and contort, even as pinpricks in her arms and neck brought forth little to no blood. Wow. The horrified crowd had no doubts. The young woman was possessed by a demon. Mata Brassier grew up in the Loire Valley. As I had said, she was considered a little odd, with her dressing like a man and her apparent uninterest in getting married. But her parents started to notice some more disturbing things, things they felt were signs of demonic possession. The reasons aren't clear, but the Brassiers claimed a neighbor, Anne Chevreau, was a witch who had cursed their daughter. Anne was middle-aged and unmarried, and whatever specifics Mata accused her of was enough, because Anne was thrown in jail. You would think that Mata's family's next step would be to call a priest and have an exorcism performed to save their daughter's soul, but that's not what happened. Oh, I think I know where this is going. Her father, who was a weaver, decided to take his possessed daughter on the road. They traveled from town to town, and despite several priests attempting to expel the demon possessing her, it would always return and Mata and her father would travel to the next town and the next show. Eventually they arrived in Paris, and Mata became pretty famous. So famous, in fact, that the king himself was so convinced and so concerned that he ordered an exorcism. Of course, there were some political things going on in France at that time. King Henry IV was campaigning tolerance towards the Huguenots, or Protestants. The Catholic Church saw the Protestants as a threat. During her show, the voice coming from Mata's body called itself Beelzebub 
and it referred to itself as the Prince of the Huguenots. The Catholic Church latched onto this as proof that the Protestants must be in league with the devil. They wanted her show to continue, to put an end to the king's campaign. In fact, Catholic priests had been traveling with them for some time, performing exorcisms during the show, delighted that the demon always returned. Wow, so the priests were on the payroll also. They were. They wanted it to fail, so it would keep going. Right. The king, of course, wanted this demon exercised from Mata's body so his campaign could continue. Even if they were making boatloads of money, you can't exactly say no to the king, so another exorcism was performed. But this time, it was different. The king put his very own personal physician, Michel Marisco, in charge, and Marisco was incredibly clever. Mata was brought to the Abbey of St. Genusua, and the Bishop of Paris joined them. The bishop brought five priests with him, and Marisco brought 11 other physicians, so it was quite the crowd. Wow, I would have loved to be in attendance at that show. Mm -hmm. Crowded room. The bishop and Marisco began by kneeling down to pray. As soon as they began, Mata fell onto her back, convulsing like a wild animal. Her eyes rolled back in her head, and that horrible voice seemed to emanate from her stomach, shouting vulgarities and threats. Undeterred, Marisco stood before Mata. He placed a piece of everyday wood in her mouth, noting that she sat complacently, with no reaction. Then he brought out another piece of wood, this time telling her that he held a piece of the true cross. Mata immediately reacted violently to the holy relic, spitting and writhing. But test one was completed. In reality, the piece of wood he held before her was just an ordinary wood. The piece in her mouth, which she hadn't reacted to at all, was the actual holy relic. (laughs) Well, I guess a piece of holy wood in your mouth doesn't always get the job done. (laughs) Not in this case. (laughs) Next, Marisco relied on Mata's claim that the demon spoke all languages. Marisco had priests speak to her in Latin, but Mata was unable to understand them or respond in any way. So test two was completed. Test three was also pretty ingenious. Marisco had priests read to Mata from the Bible in Latin, since he'd previously determined that she didn't understand the language. The priests read sections over and over, and once again, Mata writhed and spat, cursing and convulsing. The thing is, it wasn't the Bible at all. They actually were reading the poem, the Aeneid, by Virgil. Oh. So... You know, they tricked her into thinking that they were reading from the Bible. Right. Even Yeah. He's pretty clever. He was very clever. But the priests witnessing these tests still weren't convinced. Marisco would have to do more to prove that Mata was a fake. Charles Muron, the Archbishop of Lyon, stepped up to Marisco's aid. For nearly a week, Muron had the priests give Mata water to drink. A lot of it. What they didn't tell her was that the water she drank day in and day out was holy water. They watched as Mata happily quenched her thirst but had no other reaction. To finally put an end to the scam, the priests then came into the room with a holy water vessel, which they had filled with unblessed ordinary water. Just a few sprinkles of the ordinary water on her face sent Mata into spasms of fury. As you've all guessed for a while now, Mata Brassier was a complete fake. But she was a talented fake, performing both ventriloquism and contortion, so we have to give her that. The only thing that really concerns me is that woman, poor Anne Chevro, the woman that Mata had accused in the very beginning of afflicting her with a demon in the first place. But I found this interesting— When Chevro was released from prison, she maintained that she never thought Mata was never possessed, 
but that she was mentally ill. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that's that's too bad that this woman had to go to prison over this. Right. And it could be a valid point. I mean, Mata was either an incredibly talented actress or she may have truly believed that she was possessed. That could be. Mata was sentenced to prison for several months. I don't know what happened to her father, but since I couldn't find evidence that he was also sent to prison as her accomplice, I wonder if she had managed to trick him as well. Perhaps he wasn't in on the scheme at all and truly believed his daughter was possessed. But then I guess the question is, was it his idea to go on the road, or was it Mata's? So, what happened to Mata after she was released? Well, she went back to touring the small towns of France, only this time she performed seances. Well, you know, I don't think he had really any knowledge of her faking this. I think that she quite possibly was mentally ill, or she had, you know, been practicing and developing this thing of hers with a ventriloquism and um, the contortion. She just took it to a whole nother level. And then her father saw it as a way to make some money. I mean, he was a basket weaver. Why wouldn't you want to take advantage of this and go out on the road and make more money for you and your family? Or she saw the opportunity, too, because that was one way to make sure she didn't have to get married. This is true. She was quite an interesting young lady for her time. She was. Hey, did you know? Cousins whose parents are identical twins share 25% of their DNA instead of the usual 12.5. While full siblings share 50% of their DNA, half siblings share 25%. That's why, though children of identical twins are legally cousins, they are genetically the equivalent of half-siblings. Who'd have thunk it? So, Beth, let me ask you this. When you were growing up, did your mom ever try to scare you uh, with threats of the boogeyman? My mom? No. But I think I was pretty young when I first heard about the boogeyman. I can't remember whether it was from family members or if it was on the school bus, but I do know that I was aware of his existence from a pretty young age. Why? Did your mom try to scare you with the boogeyman? Oh, yeah, she did indeed. You know, when I was around, I'd like to say seven or eight or nine, you know, we'd have to go shopping. And sometimes uh, we would have to drive by this little white house. You know, it had... Uh, white paint on it and it was peeling really bad all over and then i remember these trees going up and kind of like forming over the top of it like it was a canopy and it had looked like it had been neglected for many many years and my mom would slow down you know and point out that that was where the boogeyman lived Jeez. i know i'm not sure what her motive was at the time i don't know what the point of it was other than her to entertain herself Maybe her parents told her the same thing, you know, when she was growing up. So who exactly is the boogeyman? I mean, what exactly does he look like and where exactly did he come from? You know, there are no solid answers to any of those questions. The only consensus seems to be that the boogeyman exists in every culture around the world and that he or it was created to scare children into following rules set out by adults in their lives. One common thread through most cultures is that the boogeyman has claws or talons and may have horns, but not necessarily. That's funny because for me, the boogeyman was much more of a human man than anything else. Although I only had a vague idea of how I pictured him, I thought maybe a long black coat or a wide-brimmed black hat, but he didn't really have facial features, and he didn't have horns or talons or anything like that. I suppose he was more of an idea in my head and not specific. But what did you think he looked like? Well, you know, I never seen any pictures to, like, kind of get any reference from, but I pictured him as an old, decrepit, thin man with, like, tattered clothes that kind of and he kind of glided across the ground when he moved. 
and that he was so fast that you couldn't outrun him. Now that I look back, he kind of reminds me of the old perverted man on Family Guy that's always after Chris, <laughs> <laughs> but but without the walker, and he had a much sinister voice. <laughs> So the name boogeyman can be traced back to the Middle English word bogey, which means terror or scarecrow. But even the base of the word bogey is similar across cultures, taking on either the base sounds of bogey or puck. So as far as what the boogeyman does, well, it depends on the culture, since there are dozens of different creatures that all fall under the umbrella term of boogeyman. And it also depends on what parents are trying to steer their children away from. The Met Minwi is a boogeyman in Haitian culture. He has spindly legs, which make him over two stories tall. And he walks through towns at midnight, searching for anyone who dares to still be outside. And if he catches them, he eats them. <laughs> That sounds way more terrifying, something that's on such tall, spindly legs that it's two stories tall. It's a very good reason to make sure you're home before midnight. That it is. One version of the boogeyman that seems to be prevalent in some South American countries like Argentina and Brazil is the hombre del saco, or sack man. The sack man can also be found in other cultures as well, including Spain, Asia, and Africa. Although there are some differences in his appearance and his motivation, the sack man story is generally the same. In South America specifically, the sack man is an ugly, gaunt man who kidnaps naughty children in broad daylight and stuffs them in a sack, which he slings over his shoulder. He may sell the naughty children or eat them, depending, I guess, depending on his mood. <laughs> or if he's hungry. <laughs> <laughs> or if he needs some change for a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> that could that could be. <laughs> In other areas, he may walk his rounds at supper time or after dark. I guess it depends on whether or not he is searching for naughty children, children who are always late to dinner, or children who sneak out after dark. In some cultures, a figure like Sackman works as St. Nicholas's evil sidekick. And he's a variation on Krampus. Oh, okay. There's another variation of the sack man that's a little closer home to us. The Bonham Septors, or Seven O'Clock Man from Quebec, Canada. Even though Bonham translates to good man, it's used ironically because the Seven O'Clock Man is exactly what he sounds like. A boogeyman who will get all the naughty children who aren't asleep by 7 p.m. Wait, my my bedtime when I was a kid was always 8 p.m., at least as far as I can remember. So you're telling me my parents put me in danger every single time we visited my grandmother in Montreal. Yeah, it sounds like uh, they were just offering you up. Gee, <laughs> gee, thanks, Mom and Dad. The 7 o'clock man wears a long black cloak and a black hat, and also stuffs any kids who are still awake into his sack to be carried away. It's not clear what he does to them once he's gotten them, though maybe the threat was scary enough to, you know, not go any further with the story. So the fear was in the unknown. Well, that's interesting, because my mom's side of the family is Canadian, and she grew up in Quebec. So that's kind of funny that my idea of the boogeyman had a long coat and a hat, although I can guarantee it was never my mom that taught me about the boogeyman because she just wouldn't do that. Right. And my dad's side of the family was all from Canada. So my mom just went on with her own kind of little version of it. So I, I don't know. Hmm. I mean, it's it's pretty interesting. The boogeyman exists in the American South also, of course. And it's especially in the Cherokee Nation, although I'm sure other native tribes had their own versions. During the annual corn festival, young Cherokee males would wear masks that represented the boogeyman and were themselves called the boogerman. <laughs> That's not funny. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> yeah, just that, a little bit of childishness escaped before I could stop. Well, it. the booger man isn't quite as creepy as the boogeyman. Right. Although he could slime you, I guess. <laughs> Maybe that's what the Flatwoods monster was. <laughs> Perhaps so. So they would perform a specific dance meant to scare children. Bloody Bones is a boogeyman also. Bloody Bones is in a bunch of tales in the South also. Although he originated in England, he made his way to the American South via the Gullah culture. He is a skeleton type boogeyman who seems to be blamed for all kinds of things and is used as threats by parents against doing all kinds of things. In some stories, he is more of a swamp creature who will pull children down into the murky water if they get too close. In other versions, Bloody Bones lives under the stairs in a dark cupboard. If you were daring enough or brave enough and peeked in on him, you would see him crouching on a pile of bones, blood dripping down from his skeleton face. The pile of bones belonged to children who told lies or said bad words. Yikes. That's a really nasty one. Th Whoa. That one's creepy. Bloody Bones is another creature who is confused by Haint Blue. Oh, like the Boo Hag from episode two. Exactly. Oh, cool. So if you're in the South and you see that blue paint on the porch, you know, ceilings and around windows and door frames... You might be safe from the boo hag and bloody bones. Well, good thing. The boogeyman stories in the U.S. have all kinds of variations, too. You know, some say he scratches the windows at night. Some say he can slither like a snake or turn into a fog or a mist. You know, he might hide under your bed or in the closet. In a nutshell, the boogeyman is everywhere. Hmm. So, as I said earlier... The stories about the boogeyman most often came about as a way to deter children from doing something their parents found inherently dangerous, like staying away from water sources, not going out in the dark, you know, avoiding the woods. Then he sort of morphed into a inside ghoul. He'll get you for swearing or lying or staying up past your bedtime. By whatever name he goes by or what ever frightening deed he supposedly does, the boogeyman has been an effective, if not cruel way to stop kids all over the world for hundreds and hundreds of years from doing something against their parents' wishes. Well, I guess it worked. Did, uh, did you ever try to scare your kids with a, with a boogeyman threat? No, but that home that my mom used to tell me about, you know, when we uh, were out running our errands, I remember driving by it once and telling my girls that my mom used to say that was the boogeyman's house. And I don't think I even got a response from them. Perhaps I should have changed it up a bit and said it was the Babadook's home. <laughs> right. Because that's much more frightening. And they knew about the Babadook. <laughs> they did. And they loved that movie. <laughs> it was the first horror movie your girls ever made me watch when I first met you. And I remember your daughter, your youngest, was about seven at the time. And I remember trying to hide my face, but not letting her see that I was hiding my face because she kept pulling on me going, this is the good part. You have to see this part. <laughs> Didn't you hide under the covers that night? <laughs> Probably. But, you know, they've given me a good education in horror movies and none of them scare me anymore. Very rarely do I get scared. Well, that's a positive thing. <laughs> Well, with that said, I think that about wraps it up for this episode. So thank you for joining us, all you wanders, and we'll see you next week for an all-new episode of Where Our Minds Wander. See you soon. Take care. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to traveling with you again to the places where our minds wander. If you like what you heard, please take a moment and provide us with a five-star rating and a comment. It really helps us move up the list so people can find us. See you next week for an all new episode of Where Our Minds Wander. <laughs>